The Inferno, Dante's Immortal Drama of a Journey Through Hell, The Dark Wood of Error. Midway in his allotted threescore years and ten, Dante comes to himself with a start and realizes that he has strayed from the true way into the dark wood of error, worldliness. As soon as he has realized his loss, Dante lifts his eyes and sees the first light of the sunrise, the sun being the symbol of divine illumination, lightening the shoulders of a little hill, the Mount of Joy. It is the Easter season, the time of the resurrection, and the sun is in its equinoctical rebirth. This juxtaposition of joyous symbols fills Dante with hope, and he sets out at once to climb directly up the Mount of Joy, but almost immediately his way is blocked by three beasts of worldliness, the leopard of malice and fraud, the lion of violence and ambition, and the she-wolf of lust. These beasts, and especially the she-wolf, drive him back despairing into the darkness of error. But just as all seems lost, a figure appears to him. It is the shade of Virgil, Dante's symbol of human reason. Virgil explains that he has been sent to lead Dante from error. There can, however, be no direct ascent past the beasts. The man who would escape them must go a longer and harder way. First he must descend through hell, the recognition of sin, then he must ascend through purgatory, the renunciation of sin, and only then may he reach the pinnacle of joy and come to the light of God. Virgil offers to guide Dante, but only as far as human reason can go. Another guide, Beatrice, symbol of divine love, must take over for the final ascent, for human reason is self-limited. Dante submits himself joyously to Virgil's guidance, and they move off. The Descent It is the evening of the first day, Friday. Dante is following Virgil, and finds himself tired and despairing. How can he be worthy of such a vision as Virgil has described? He hesitates and seems about to abandon his calling. To comfort him, Virgil explains how Beatrice descended to him in limbo, and told him of her concern for Dante. It is she, the symbol of divine love, who sends Virgil to lead Dante from error. She has come into hell itself on this errand, for Dante cannot come to divine love unaided. Reason must lead him. Moreover, Beatrice has been sent with the prayers of the Virgin Mary and St. Lucia. Rachel also figures in this heavenly scene, which Virgil recounts. Virgil explains all this and reproaches Dante. How can he hesitate any longer, when such heavenly power is a concern for him, and Virgil himself has promised to lead him safely? Dante understands at once such forces cannot fail him, and his spirits rise in joyous anticipation. Dante and his guide Virgil continue on their downward spiral throughout all the various levels of hell. There Dante would witness the fates of those who while on earth were fraudulent and malicious, and how the fortune-tellers and diviners were also punished. In addition to this, Dante would go on to encounter famous people from history, such as Nimrod, who built the Tower of Babel, and Alexander the Great, who conquered the known world in his time. Caiaphas, the high priest who condemned Jesus to be crucified on the charge of blasphemy, is punished by being crucified on the floor of hell by three great stakes, which in this position all passing sinners have to trample upon him. Thus, he must suffer upon his own body, the weight of all the world's hypocrisy, as Christ suffered upon his body the pain of all the world's sins. Dante and Virgil continue to progress down through the rungs or rings of hell until they come to the ninth and final circle, the center of hell, where Satan is encased up to his waist in ice. Circle Nine of Hell, Causatus. At the bottom, Dante finds himself on a huge frozen lake. This is Causatus, the ninth circle, the fourth and last great water of hell, and here, fixed in the ice, each according to his guilt, are punished sinners guilty of treachery against those who betrayed their benefactors. The ice is divided into four concentric rings, marked only by the different positions of the damned within the ice. This is Dante's symbolic equivalent of the final guilt. The treacheries of these souls were denials of love, which is God, and of all human warmth. Only the remorseless dead in the center of the ice will serve to express their natures. As they denied God's love, so are they furthest removed from the light and warmth of his Son. As they denied all human ties, so are they bound only by the unyielding ice. The first round is Cana, named after Cain. Here lie those who are treacherous against blood ties. They have their necks and heads out of the ice, and are permitted to bow their heads, a double boon since it allows them some protection from the freezing gale, and further allows their tears to fall without freezing their eyes shut. Here Dante sees Alessandro and Napoleon Degli Alberti, and he speaks to Camacron, who identifies other sinners of this round. The second round is Antonora, named for Antonor, the Trojan who is believed to have betrayed his city to the Greeks. Here lie those guilty of treachery to country. They too have their heads above the ice, but they cannot bend their necks, which are gripped by the ice. 
Here Dante accidentally kicks the head of Boca degli Abati, and then proceeds to treat him with a savagery he has shown to no other soul in hell. Boca names some of his fellow traitors, and the poets pass on to discover two heads frozen together in one hole, and one of them is gnawing the nape of the other's neck. In reply to Dante's exhortation, the sinner who is gnawing his companion's head looks up, wipes his bloody mouth on the victim's hair, and tells his harrowing story. He is Count Ugolino, and the wretch he gnaws at is Archbishop Ruggieri. Both are in Antora for treason. In life they had once plotted together. Then Ruggieri betrayed his fellow plotter and caused his death by starvation, along with his four sons. In the most pathetic and dramatic passage of the Inferno, Ugolino details how their prison was sealed and how his sons dropped dead before him, one by one, weeping for food. His terrible tale serves only to renew his grief and hatred, and he has hardly finished it before he begins to gnaw Ruggieri again with renewed fury. In the immutable law of hell, the killer by starvation becomes the food of his victim. The poets leave Ugolino and enter Ptolemaea, so named for the Ptolemaeus of Maccabees, who murdered his father-in-law at a banquet. Here are punished those who were treacherous against the ties of hospitality. They lie with only half of their faces above the ice, and their tears freeze in their eye sockets, sealing them with little crystal visors. Thus, even the comfort of tears is denied them. Here Dante finds Friar Albergio and Branca di Oria, and discovers the terrible power of Ptolemaea. So great is its sin that the souls of the guilty fall into its torments even before they die, leaving their bodies still on earth, inhabited by demons. The Center of Hell, Satan On march the banners of the king. Virgil begins as the poets face the last depth. He is quoting a medieval hymn, and to it he adds the distortion and perversion of all that lies about him. On march the banners of the king, of hell. And there before them, in an infernal parody of the Godhead, they see Satan in the distance, his great wings beating like a windmill. It is their beating that is the source of the icy wind of Cossetus, the exhalation of all evil. All about him in the ice are strewn the sinners of the last round, Judaica, named for Judas Iscariot. These are the treacherous to their masters. They lie completely sealed in the ice, twisted and distorted into every conceivable posture. It is impossible to speak to them, and the poets move on to observe Satan. Satan is fixed into the ice at the center to which flow all the rivers of guilt, and as he beats his great wings as if to escape, their icy wind only freezes him more securely into the polluted ice. In a grotesque parody of the Trinity, he has three faces, each a different color, and in each mouth he clamps a sinner, whom he rips eternally with his teeth. Judas Iscariot is in the central mouth, Brutus and Cassius in the mouths on either side. Having seen all, the poets now climb through the center, grappling hand over hand down the hairy flank of Satan himself, a last supremely symbolic action. And at last, when they have passed the center of all gravity, they emerge from hell. A long climb from the earth's center to the Mount of Purgatory awaits them, and they push on without rest, ascending along the sides of the river Leith, till they emerge once more to see the stars of heaven just before dawn on Easter Sunday. <laughs>